All right, Wanda. Wake up! I'm woke! Whoa! Marjorie Taylor Greene! I'm woke. What you have to understand is that the person who actually invented the term woke was named Huddy William Ledbetter. He was talking about a serious, serious injustice that in the 1930s, nine young black men riding a train as everybody was riding a train looking for jobs. The economy of the United States was horrible. Everybody was looking for a job. They were confronted on that railroad car by some white hoodlums who were also looking for a job. And what happened is they got in a fight. And the white boys got whooped. Now, of course, they're angry, and they stop in this small rural town and tell the police, OK, that the black boys started it. Of course, very quickly, the next small rural station has Many, many people who are outraged that these young nine black boys had attacked their youth. But the problem really came, not at that point, the juncture, the problem really came when there were two white women there who were, were kind of modern, they were a little loose. They had control of their bodies, and they enjoyed themselves, but they was poor. I should say po, but they were poor. The important thing that you have to know is because the social pressure was so great, they could not be seen, caught in the presence of black men without being ostracized, totally, totally alienated. So they said, we got raped. And for that, those nine black boys had their lives destroyed. And it was Huddy William Ledbetter, whose stage name was Leadbelly. And if you're into blues and folk music, you will hear him. If you haven't heard, write it down, because you need to hear it. Because he responded, because this is all about how we respond. He responded by telling his audience, be aware, use your third eye, pay attention, it's dangerous out there. If they would be so outraged to kill these children, well, they didn't kill them, but throw them in jail for a lifetime, it's pretty bad. They were ready to hang them pretty much the next day. It's a whole international story. I don't even have time to get all to it, but I'm going to let you. You now have the notes, OK? You now have the notes. What you have to understand is he told everybody to stay woke. So Marjorie Taylor Greene, I'm here, I'm woke. And I want you to be woke. I come from a small town in Michigan where right next to it was a nice library in a place called Dearborn. I don't know if it's anybody actually did a comparison, but I think it's like Birmingham, Alabama. But I was not allowed none of the black people in the smallest, we used to be the smallest village in the United States, could go. It was a town created by a Henry Ford for black workers. He wanted hmm, 
to take advantage of the economic advantage of using scabs. But either way, I couldn't go to the library, and my, our parents had to invest. In fact, we got a brand new world book encyclopedia. And I was happy, OK, because I could sit in my house, in my room, almost like COVID, and actually read. And I read about everything in the world. I, I loved that encyclopedia. In fact, I still have them. And the reason I have them is because, even though I love Google, um, is that it is important to have the knowledge. And I'm very disturbed that there is a small town in Michigan that will vote in three weeks to defund the entire library system if they do not take away about five books. They will defund the entire library. They've already harassed the director into resigning. So when we come here today, especially for the young librarians. We're not coming here to talk always about the old. We're here to talk about what is facing you today, the kinds of battles that you will have to strike. And yes, I love Kafka. I love all the writers. I even like Shakespeare, OK? In fact, when I saw students reading Twilight, I was like, why are they reading it? The books are this thick. Why are they reading? OK? And I opened one of those books, and I started reading, and I, I understood. It's unrequited love in vampire style. <laughs> OK? And I became a Twilighter, OK? And that's what you've got to do. You've got to pay attention to the young people. I know you think you're young. Yeah, 25. <laughs> Give me a break. Anyway, but you have to, you're the elders for the people under you, just as we are your elders. And you have to remember that, and it's hard sometimes to remember what it was like to be 15, what it was like to be 12 or 9. But you've got to go back, and you've got to listen. As Frida talked about, you've got to listen. You've got to be attentive, OK? And I don't know how the folks in Jamestown, Michigan, are going to vote, but I pray for their children, because libraries are very much needed. Now, the future of libraries. The question from critical thinking to CRT, did I say a bad word? OK, this is something that oftentimes so many people I was challenged, because when they, it was suggested that I do CRT, I was like, no, nah, I don't know these people. I'm going to discuss something so controversial where such misinformation, such emotions are there. And I'm not a lawyer. I'm, not, I'm a lay person like you. And I was like, OK, yes, but I've been reading. I've been paying attention. I've been watching tapes. I'm going to lectures because I want to understand CRT. And the reason I want to understand it it's because it developed from critical thinking. That's what most people don't understand, OK? Hmm. Where do we start? When I look out into this audience, I'm looking beyond your dress, your attire, your title. Some impressive titles here. I have to actually see those of you who are brilliant researchers, organized, oh, fantastic. I have to see those who are parents, who are educators to their core. I have to 
look compassionately at those who are some of the best mentors in the world. I've never gone to a library and had a bad experience. Isn't that wonderful? I was like, oh, this is really happy. But you are the guardians of truth. Oh, a, it works when I hold it. And yet, there is fear. And there's trepidation to bravery and even for some post-traumatic stress syndrome. See, I've been paying attention to some of the brave people who dared actually have LBGQ plus there. I don't know what they'll do when they meet maybe Aravisto's book from Britain that won what is the British equivalent of a National Book Award, because she covers it all. That plus sign goes, whoa, whoa, all right, no one can. But what I want to let you know that I'm looking at you because I need to find those who are willing to be open-minded, who are willing to change, who are willing to adapt in the 21st century. I'm not worried about those who are hardcore, who on a good day don't want to talk or discuss anything that is controversial. In fact, we have to pay attention, and I'll come back to this, on this idea of dialogue. And William Isaacs talks about dialogue. And one of the things that he talks about is that the best definition in English is that it is the meaning of relationships. So what we're talking about in understanding knowledge and our responsibility to the present and the future generations is to be committed to relationships. Why did we get, so, well, maybe you didn't, but I got excited when I was going to face to face and I was going to talk to you. I got excited. Oh, I love people. I really do. And it's important for you to understand that in education, in knowledge, that connection is not in Zoom although I would have liked to go to that internet conference in Monterey, that would have been nice. But the actual learning process has been known for thousands and thousands of years when students sat at the knees of Socrates. The open-ended questions, the dialogue discussions. This was done in India. And the elders sat around in a circle and began to talk. In Africa, when the elders came and opened the conversation to everybody in the community, not only to solve problems, but to plan and strategize for the future. That is what is missing as we are more connected but alienated from each other. We have become the other. But in Africa and many other cultures, I is we, and we are I. You'll have physicians tell you that for every cell, in that cell is everything that is human. And in every human, there are multiple cells. So think about it. We're connected. Even when we go back to history, and goes, I love history. I'm going to mess with Chris. Come on now, Chris. People talk today about the issue and the question of slavery. Just pretend for a minute, Chris is a slaveholder. <laughs> and I am Chris's slave. Okay? Together, this is, the, this is the system of slavery. Yeah, if he's sick, he wants me. But anyway, but this is the system of slavery. Why, when people talk in terms of history, they only talk about me? What happened to him? If slavery's still bothering me, it's got to be bothering him. 
Not in the same way, but there is a connection. Take away me, who is Chris? Without me, who is he? How does he define himself? What identity does he have? None. None. And vice versa. If Chris goes away, if Chris goes away, who am I? How do I define myself? So just as Roman slaves were connected to their society, and they had 10,000 every year to renew the stability, Chris and I are connected in America. We're connected still. And people don't want to understand that because it takes critical thinking to understand that this relationship has not been broken. It is still here. And that is why we still have racial problems. And it is not one-sided. Thank you, Chris. We're going to discuss someone called Derek Bell. And excuse me if I jump around, because I get excited about history. And I get excited about learning. OK. Uh, let me see one more. Yeah, here we go. It started, though, at first I was going to wait to the end. Yeah. And uh, keep the time on me, Chris, because I will talk forever. <laughs> and so, it's just a history, <laughs> OK? Martin R. Delaney, anybody ever heard of him? Uh, before there was Malcolm X, Martin R. Delaney was one of the first nationalists. He wanted Congress of the United States, if we are after the Civil War, and he fought in it, but if we are unwanted, then give us a state in the Western territories. We don't have to live around you. We will be happy. Mm, maybe Arizona wouldn't have actually be there. We would have it. Anyway, that's what he wanted to do. And of course, that was not allowed because in the relationship, I'm very important. And they wouldn't allow it. In fact, the Civil War really began because what? They wanted to end slavery in the Western territories. That's why the Civil War began, because those huh, one-fourth slave owners wanted to carry it there, and the three-fourths of people who didn't own slaves understood that if slaves go there, then I don't have the same rights, and I'd like to be free. So don't allow it in the Western territories. And that's when the battle really began. I simplified it, but you can take a class, <laughs> OK? But the important thing is also a person by the name of Franz Fanon. He was an Algerian freedom fighter and a psychologist. And he preceded an understanding. He is one of the first people that found it. And he had a problem with what are two irres what is it? What is it? Irre irreconcilable. Okay? Irreconcilable differences. He assessed, he was looking at African Americans, he was looking at Africans, he was looking at Frenchmen, he was looking in terms of the Frenchmen in Algeria, what the colonists wanted, what are they doing? And he came up with the idea that this system is immovable. It's, it's a part of the structure. But immovable, he talks about, I will create myself. I will resist. But the problem is, if it's immovable, how are you creating yourself? 
seems like, hmm, not working. And that comes to a conclusion later by Derrick Bell, who worked for decades after Charles Houston, Thurgood Marshall. Derrick Bell was working. And he was fighting this battle. And then he came to understand that many of the lawyers who were working for the parents in the South, the parents wanted their children to have an education. They didn't need integration. They weren't too fond of busing. They just want their children to be educated. And the lawyers begin to fight for integration. The lawyers begin to fight for busing. And the parents say, if my child isn't getting educated in the valley, I don't, they don't need to go there. Let me have good schools here. Let me have my children by me and not on the bus for two or three hours. And there became a conflict. And Derek Bell, as a legal scholar, began to observe this and began to say, hmm, this isn't working. We've got a problem, and it's a problem that we're beginning to create. And since we've been working for decades that this racism, which is really a child of slavery, has been with us for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's not going nowhere. So he wrote a book called The Faces in the Bottom of the Well. I love it. Faces in the bottom of the well. How can you see your face in the well? Hello. It has to be a really bright day. <laughs> okay. But one of the things that you have to understand is Derek Bell. Did you read Space Traders? Okay, one of the, wow, okay. If you're into science fiction, you like Dune. Nah, I, I hope you do, okay. My son is forcing me to play, okay. And I hope I learn it soon because I'm tired of getting whooped. Anyway, um, Space Traders, he comes up with the idea that racism is permanent and important part of American society. It's not going anywhere. And therefore, we as people who desire freedom, white, black, whatever, we have to have new strategies. We have to have new goals. Fighting every day or every year for a new holiday. We just got Juneteenth. Yeah, I love Juneteenth. I love the recognition of Tulsa, Oklahoma. I need to know how very wealthy black people were attacked. But that's not ending racism. And he's tired at this point of seeing the actual problem ignored and the comfort people get just comfortable with your day will come. Just wait. Just wait a little longer. You just have to fight hard enough. Just keep pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. And we heard that somewhere 100 years ago. No. He's saying no. It is permanent, you need to pay attention to it, and it's not going anywhere. How many people have read Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow? I have not come next year and you haven't read this book. You are the leaders in the library. Excuse me? See, CRT would be analyzing the problems that are faced and when you have one of the largest, quote, civilized countries in the world, and it has 2.5 million people incarcerated, there's something wrong. Percentage-wise, you don't even have that in Iran. And we know what's happening in Iran right now. But the United States has that. Why is that? Why is that? 
And he began to look into the legal institutions. He began to look at the laws. He began to say, well, we got to pay attention. Even to the laws that are supposed to right the injustice in Shelby versus Holder in 2013, they cut the actual belly of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. They cut it. So that now it can't even protect. And that's why you have all these voting rights restrictions that are coming. This is not inadvertent. This is not something that just happened. These are systemic problems that Derrick Bell says we have to look at. And any critically thinking person would agree. If you think logically, take logic a little step further, start using and looking at the evidence and the argument, evaluating, reflecting more, that deep reading that Ms. Wolf talks about, that deep, deep reading, then you begin to get CRT. And Space Trader, you gotta read it. If you like Star Wars, all that stuff, you gotta read it. But he says, I hope to emphasize the necessity of moving beyond the comforting belief that time and the generosity of its people will solve America's racial problem. That's an argument, that's a premise, okay? We have to move beyond. It's not working. It hasn't worked for 200 years. What do we do? I realize, this is Derrick Bell saying, I realize that even with the challenge to rethinking these stories pose, because he has one that gives you a license, a short story, gives you a license to discriminate. You just have to pay a fee like a hunting fee. But it would be used to educate youngsters and to create new programs in the library. But you could discriminate, you just have to pay a tax. Out, far out, isn't it? But we, everybody gets a fishing license and honey license. Everybody thinks about it. Hmm. Megan, where's Megan? Is she here? She's on the panel later. She's dealing with camping and new programs there. We could talk about the trail that goes into Yosemite. And every part of that trail where the stagecoach used to run, there's one of the, George Monroe, who was one of the stagecoach drivers who also took Teddy Roosevelt when he visited the area, that has significance. That when people are skiing, they don't even know they're in Monroe's field. Oh Lord, life, life is really, really good. But he goes on. Any people who find it difficult to embrace my assumption that racism is permanent component of American life. I'm gonna say it again, because it's hard to swallow. Right? How many people would agree with that premise? Remember, you're gonna have to prove it. Okay, but critically thinking, it seems far out, but you have to think about it. Even legal scholars don't quote Derrick Bell. They try to ignore him. Even the students who took his classes, like Michelle Alexander, Lenny Grenier, you don't even remember her, but look her up, Bill Clinton, backed out, hmm, that's a bad thing to say. Um, but anyway, she was uh, being proposed as the assistant attorney general, very good scholar. They asked her if she liked quotas, she said no. Um, I couldn't even, my dad couldn't even get into law school at that time. Now, the goal of racial equality is, while comforting to many whites, even more elucidatory than real for blacks. Hmm. For too long, we have worked for substantive reform. Pay attention to that word, I come back to it in a minute. 
then settled for weakly worded, poorly enforced legislation, indeterminate judicial decisions, token government positions, and even holidays. If we are to seek new goals for our struggles, we must first reassess the worth of the racial assumption on which, without careful thought, we have presumed too long and relied on too long. Please understand, all the people in the neighborhood where George Floyd was were not surprised. They have been telling people and complaining about injustice and police brutality a long time. But most of America didn't believe it until they saw the pictures. And this is something you could do. You could teach cognitive dissonance. How do you get someone to believe something that they don't want to face? They won't want to look at. My students hate it when I had a picture of George Floyd. But you have to understand the rule of law and why law is important. And what happens when you break down the legal system, what happens in the society? This isn't just about black people. This is about justice overall. I wouldn't go so far as Kanye West. Oh. <laughs> Not any week, okay? Uh, basically, he's a brilliant mind, but he's gone crazy, okay? I got 10 minutes, okay? Now, substantive before I end that part. You have Clarence Thomas saying, we're originalists. We're going to take the Constitution for the way it was written and why it was ratified in 1883. We're going to keep that. No changes. No 14th Amendment. No 15th Amendment. OK? No changes. He forgot to mention the one of Loving versus Virginia, which would not have allowed him to <gasps> marry his love, Gina. But we have to pay attention very carefully. This is the connection. Critical race theory is a derivative of critical thinking and legal studies to overcome the frustration of deaths of thousands of black and brown people year after year after year. How can you ignore the deadening poverty and that poverty is not by accident. You need to understand how covenants, real estate covenants, were created. Right here in Richmond, in California, even the church cooperated to make sure that the very interracial work, factory workers, were no longer allowed to live as they had before all together. They all worked together. They all walked to work. But now the powers that be that came in and wanted to segregate began to look at ways to put certain African Americans here, workers here, and others could live here, and they couldn't cross the boundary. This is not just accidental. It is not accidental that black people live in ghettos, that Latino people live in ghettos. We could go to ghettos in Poland, but we're not talking about Poland right now. Okay? It's important that, okay, the poor housing, often daily insults of proactive racism. There used to be a joke. Moms may be used to tell. She says, I love, oh, you too young. Roy Rogers had a horse. And she says, I, I love Roy Rogers. In fact, people often call me, trigger, trigger. I think that's what they're saying. 
proactive racism. There are people like Marjorie Taylor Greene. There are many people that are on the front lines of reversing, wanting to go back in a time in America where slavery was rampant, where people of color are threatened. Please support the Equal Justice Initiative. Bring a calendar to show your young people. It shows you every day a person was lynched or hanged every day for the 364 days of the year because it was that rampant. The cause is the reason. You go, what? He walked by a window where a white person was sleeping? But that would got him lynched. If you can go down to Alabama and see uh, Brian Stevens' exhibit uh, and his beautiful theater for peace, please do. There's, that's one of those places you would want to go. And the heartbreaking discussion for your white friends that racism is not dead. I am so sick of those arguments. Because people don't believe it. I know it's hard to believe that you have a situation where you might be insulted every day and you try to tell your friends, I am upset, I'm angry, I'm mad. And they go, why? And you're going, OK, do I have to go through that again? OK? And we have books for young people that can read about those daily, daily inequities, those little slights, OK? Those small, small kind of like, gotcha. And they're happening, OK? And your refusal to negate your authentic self. You come to a point in your time where you don't care. You're the only one on the bus. You're probably going to get killed because there's five people looking at you, and they don't like you. And most black people are not in despair. They understand. I love this country, but this country does not love me. And you just face the reality. I fought. My father fought in the Korean War. Never was the same. You see pictures when he left, and you see pictures when he came back. And yet, he still, see, I can remember as a child sitting in the back seat, and we stop at the gas station, and my mom goes to use the bathroom, and two white men decide they're going to walk in on her. And my father is getting ready to kill them. And my mother had to beg and plead. We're crying in the back seat like crazy. And she begs him because she knows what will happen. And she doesn't want to lose her husband. She doesn't want her children to be without a father. She begs, she pleads only, only at the last desperation is she able to get my father there. But he doesn't speak for the rest of the trip. Those are memories. You can't wipe them away. They're part of my history. And I face them as all people of color, all people who have been discriminated. I did a uh, lecture one time, and the Irish uh, people said, we suffered too. I was locked in the trunk in the car in New York. I said, that's fine. I don't think you are wrong for bringing it up. Now just acknowledge this black man right here. And we're in a group like this. It took almost 45 minutes before she could acknowledge. And the reason I didn't let the silence stop is because she was going back and she was teaching in Harlem. But she didn't know what her students had to deal with because she was so arrogant about her own pain. I know what the pain in Ireland is. Dialogue. Now, I don't have much time, so two minutes. Let me wrap this up. 
And there's much more. I got lots of pages here. Okay. I tried to hit the most important thing. Um, technology. Science does not have ethics. Ethics used to be concerned with beauty and truth. Okay. Science. Ethics was, you had science, ethical. Today, we have manipulation of human beings using technology to sell you something, to manipulate you. They are making you addicted. If you are critical thinking, you have to have some time to reflect, to look at what you read, to look at what you observed, what you saw, go back, discuss it, do it again. But you don't have a minute. That cell phone doesn't allow you to escape. Have a class one time with the youth and just tell them to turn it off. Watch the arguments. OK? But you will be critical thinking. The important thing for you to understand is human contact is the most effective way of learning. Human contact is the most effective. And that's what librarians give. Like I told you, never went to a library I didn't like. But it's that contact. While you're introducing the technology, while you're paying attention to that, understand what's missing is the humanity intelligence of the heart. That's what's missing. And you will be promoted. You will be charged with making it better. But if you leave out that human component, it's there. Now, last thing. Human beings are conditioned. You respond before you even think about it. And those are embedded in your memories that you attach to certain arguments. So if you insult a black woman, don't be close to me if I can hit you. <laughs> I did not travel uh, when Ted Cruz, after I watched Katanji Brown Jackson in that hearing, I was glad I didn't have any place to go because I would have hurt him. Those memories, those human elements are there, and I would probably hit him before I thought about it. Yes, I'm going to get arrested. But you will see that in almost all writers that are paying attention. Young writers are telling you their experiences. People are upset because they're telling you the truth. Stand in your truth. In order to be the person that you want to be, you have to give up what they told you you were. You are librarians. You are the best in the world. I appreciate your time. Well, that jolted me awake faster than coffee. So let's give another round of applause for our two keynote speakers. Thank you so much. All right. Well, we will be taking a break. And oh, we do. Oh, we have a little time for questions. OK. We'll run a mic. We'll run a mic to you if you have questions. Just raise your hand. No CRT questions, no none of that? OK. I'll ask you a question. How many of you will make the effort to read Derrick Bell, to read Kimberly Crenshaw, not all of the misinformation, read the progenitors, the beginning? Now, if you get the critical race theory books, you're 
generation, I told you, you're elders. And those elders will follow other elders. And so you have to pay attention to what you are thinking and doing and using and making sure that you're using the critical theory. Oh, she moved it back. Okay. There are steps. There are lots of writing in that. Uh, how many people have heard of Bloom's taxonomy? Okay, that's really big. He wrote in the 1950s, but everybody discovered him now. Um, but he's used to deal with the actual content of classes and how to think and how the sections are. I'll talk to my little set up. Here's a question. What is your prediction for the future as far as racism? I agree with Derek Bell. Could you it's not going away. No, that I know. No. Uh, but how is it? Could you repeat the question? Okay. She asked, very simple, what is my prediction if I understand or agree with Derek Bell that racism is not going anywhere? Okay. Is that I correct? Yes. Okay. Now, my prediction is like... Franz Fanon, we have to continue to fight to bring as much of the human equality that is needed. Artists especially, literary people, if you have not read, oh, I don't see how much money I got, I'll give you a dollar. If the, you must read the acceptance speech of Toni Morrison were accepting the Nobel Prize in 1993. I've read it a dozen times and I'll read it again because she gives you an understanding and, and when you see her talking about language, put the word truth and knowledge right there. That's very important. What do I predict? I predict how they circumvented after George Floyd's death in terms of that there were people coming together of every nationality. You have, um, our friend Mona works with immigrants. You had Japanese, okay, persons from World War II down at the border in Mexico. I have an Ethiopian friend who is down at the border actually giving service and legal service to Haitians and Ghanaians and Nigerians who are in Mexico and understanding that some of them are given permission to stay in Mexico and then they're forgotten, okay? And the lawyers there have worked in Afghanistan. They're far fierce women, fierce women. And that's what we want. We, we have to, so because of people like that, and I'm trying to be, I'm working on it, you know, but because of that, I have hope that it will not be a perfect society, especially in my lifetime, but I will make it better for your children and my children. And all the children have to understand the history. You can blot it out, you can try. David E. Sander talks about the moral epistemology of imperialism, the language that is used to justify telling the lie that Columbus discovered America. Okay, that's a fairy tale, once upon a time. No, that is not how it started. The enslavement that was there in Europe before it was transplanted and brought to the indigenous people. Many people didn't even celebrate indigenous peoples today. We took the time in Los Angeles to deal with it. But we have people to understand it. We're facing uh, that daily kind of stuff. The city council in Los Angeles has best been busted, okay, because they recorded, okay, how their discrimination and they were really trying to curtail the black leadership in Los Angeles. They got busted. And then don't want to retire because that paycheck is good, okay, but we'll understand. Other questions? Sorry to change gears, but this question is actually for Frida. Yeah. Um, I, I have a, I have, I do a film club uh, at my uh, library, and um, we talk about communism and abortion and Michelin-starred restaurants. 
and like because of the movies that we watch. So, and, and we do it on Saturday. This is like a logistical question, right? Like we do it on Saturday and after the pandemic opened back up and people were going out, Saturday was like a bunk day. So I'm wondering like when you did your like programs that encouraged critical thinking, like when did you do those programs and who, were your, who were your audiences? Saturday afternoons right. and audiences were both young and old. We had retired people, we had college students, like occasionally even high school students. Saturdays. And I attended them, they were fun. fun. <laughs> well, because you get all kinds of people and uh, one of the things are they uh, have set ideas and they're not willing to change. Um, they don't even want to stay in the present. And so she's very good, very knowledgeable, um, and she, she leads a very good discussion. Jumping off of that and people having set ideas, um, you said you spoke, it took you 45 minutes to educate an educator on their, their experience and why their experience differed. Um, and I imagine there's a defensiveness that comes along with people equating their experiences to others that may be more weighted in a sense, even not to take away from someone's experience. Um, I find like in doing this work, um, whether you're working with a city council or you're working with a library organization, that there are boundaries and there are limitations as to how far people are willing to abandon these structures and systems and laws and whatnot. You fight to make a change by your vote and by writing policy that hopefully will hold people accountable and whatnot. But these are all part of the process of, of, of slowing everything down. It's intentional. It doesn't bring for change. So I, I agree that workshops and conversations are a start for that and really looking to the youth um, as well. But where do you go? How do you penetrate to, to really tap in and change, change make change in these, in these systems and these structures and the people that head these systems and structures and be heard and not be penalized every single time that you do? You're going to be penalized. <laughs> Expect it. Know it. Know it. And the open-mindedness that you're trying to encourage, you have to understand the process communication. Isaac, I, I got this book from Mona. Um, Isaac Williams, he basically, is William Isaac, I just did that dyslexic thing. Anyway, um, the important thing that you have to know is to break down that dialogue, the process, and know that they're going to resist. But then you change. How many people have gone to a meeting, you know what's gonna happen? You're sitting there talking to your friends and then the boss comes in with his little mentors. And they sit there and they call the meeting to order and you know, hey, she's gonna speak, he's gonna speak, there, I gotta get my two cents in because I, I want that promotion next month. And then the argument's getting kind of heated, and then the boss says, um, we have to move on. And then the plan is implemented, and it breaks down, and nobody agrees with what was committed to and what was done. You have to know that. So you have to change the structure by which you communicate. Okay? You've got to know and you have to teach them how to convert. You have to go almost back to that, what he calls a circular process. But it's the process where we're in a circle and we're just going to talk. Okay? We're not, there's, there's other times that we have on a, uh, a pressure time schedule and something like that. But we got to first to sit and talk. And you have to listen, you have to listen attentively. I don't like Marjorie Taylor Greene. But I listened to her court hearing and everything she said. Because I've got to explain 
when a youngster or a member of my family runs into a Marsden children. And so I have to teach them how to listen, how to say. Best thing was when Ketanji Brown Jackson on the first day, she took originalism and used originalism against the people who talked originalism, and she pointed out that when they were deciding on the Voting Rights Act, okay, in the 1860s in terms of this, that they did discuss race. That's why they passed the 14th and 15th Amendments. And she took it to them in the arguments. Now, it was not going to change Clarence Thomas, but the world was listening that day, and it's going to change other people. So being attentive, not get too frustrated. You know, you have some good friends to talk to. You not get too frustrated, but know that you are making a change if you teach them how to just communicate. There is tacit learning. People don't even think about why they did certain things, why they hurt someone. They don't even think about it. We gotta take a break. But we got to do it. We take a break. I, we are here. Uh, my friend Frida and I are here. We're glad to take some questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much.